Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to AHIB um, team for the kind invitation and warm welcome. It's always a pleasure to share uh, our minds. Uh, and I was two weeks ago in Barcelona for such an occasion. And right before I came on stage, there was a, a person speaking who said, and I quote, uh, some people are claiming to forecast the future and uh, maybe they have a crystal ball, but don't listen to them, don't listen to the gurus. And right after that, I came on stage and my presentation was called 2016-17 forecast. So it was a bit of a challenge. And uh, maybe you've seen I changed uh, the title to prospects. Uh, it seemed like a more neutral word to me. And uh, I don't claim to be a guru, uh, at least not yet. Uh, I would still have to grow a big bird uh, to, to make that happen. But I still think we, are, we can share some interesting points with you today uh, regarding the oxid market. Uh, our company has been around for about 20 years now. It's uh, fully owned by the, the people who work there, and we are not involved uh, neither in grain trading or, or production. We are purely uh, market analysts, and our activities are centered around the publication of a monthly report, uh, one for grains, one for oil seeds, and uh, on also our website, where we have all the database. And we also provide special consultancy uh, when required. And there you got uh, the details of what we offer, uh, both on the report and uh, the website. So, uh, I think we have a very interesting year uh, on the oil seed market uh, for the, the com beginning of the campaign, this campaign 2016-17, because we have a contrast, contrasting, sorry, contrasting uh, situation. We have on the one hand quite a global bearish situation, especially for on the soybean complex, you know, so that will go through the mills uh, towards the rapeseed price, but we have a tight rapeseed situation in the EU where prices should be quite supported. And I will try to explain, uh, going through these points, why that is. But first, uh, just keeping in mind a few factors uh, that uh, have an impact on the oil seed market as well. Uh, the first one is, the, of course, the crude oil price, uh, which we see maybe increasing a little bit uh, in the months ahead, but still, um, having a cap on vegetable prices, and as a result, having a cap on rapeseed prices as well. It's been, uh, the feed demand uh, worldwide should be growing uh, slightly, uh, and we don't see a big increase in the share of meals, uh, which for the time being are still uh, a little bit expensive compared to grains. So the share of meals combined should remain about 28% of the total compound feed uh, globally. And that's, uh, that has been already uh, very well said by, by Jack in the previous presentation, but uh, the record grain harvest are gonna wait on, on the global uh, grain ends and oil seed prices. And uh, we see stock to use increasing for the third year in a row, uh, which, uh, which gives like a, a bearish environment for the whole sector. So how have prices reacted? Uh, if you go back from July 13, uh, where we had quite high uh, crude oil prices and quite low stock to use uh, worldwide, prices were rel relatively high uh, and they dropped uh, quite significantly for the past uh, three years now. And if we look on, at the most recent um, period, uh, we have seen a spike in the US soybean price right before it fell again back to around $350 a ton. That was mostly due to uh, speculation about a possible drought in the US uh, during the summer, uh, which turned out to be, uh, to be a, fine, uh, a fine climate and a, a very uh, good crop uh, coming in right now. But what's interesting, I think, as well, is that the rapeseed price uh, has, has stood, has stood its ground, I think. Is that the correct word in English, stood? Yeah. Uh, as to this work, is, is, uh, is ground, um, and I think that really can be explained by the supply and demand analysis that uh, we'll show later. So, a bearish global oil seed market, why is that? 
the main reason is that we have a record soybean crop and a record sensing crop going on right now uh, in the northern hemisphere, be it in the US or in the Black Sea. Uh, so we expect about plus 17 million tons for, uh, for soybean, plus four, plus five million tons for sunseed, but we expect uh, rapeseed production to decrease once again this year um, worldwide. We have uh, with uh, higher supplies and relatively uh, strong demand uh, worldwide for, for the meals, uh, with, uh, although it, it's not going to increase a lot as a percentage, it's, it's, uh, it represents quite a, a lot, of, lot of volumes. We expect crush uh, to increase uh, markedly, especially of course for soybean, for sunseed, uh, but we expect rapeseed uh, crush to decrease slightly. So, the soybean stocks should be comfortable at the end of the crop year, so by September next year, should be quite comfortable in the US, uh, up to 9.3 million tons, uh, which is significantly higher than what we've seen uh, this year and of course the year before. That's uh, slightly different figures from what you have on your, uh, on your slides. It's been updated with the latest data we had. And the main conclusion of that is that prices of soybean do not have any upward potential. Uh, we are in a bearish situation. Prices are lowered and have no reasons to, to recover, to go high, except if we have a problem in South America. And that's pretty much the same situation with maize. Uh, there is still a big question mark on how it's going to be uh, in South America with the, maybe La Nina coming in. And we also see in Argentina, uh, we might see a lower crop than the 56 million tons that we forecast for the time being because they recently decided to maintain the export tax they have on soybean. So for a domestic producer, it makes soybean less attractive uh, compared, for example, with, uh, with maize. So we might see a, a steeper decline in the, in the Argentinian production. So. We don't see either prices go down uh, before we know what's going on in South America uh, because there is still a risk that we have lower production there uh, than the, the figures we have currently. On the other hand, we might have a higher US production uh, because the yields already look great. Uh, so we might have the same total global production but with uh, maybe slightly different repartition. The vegetal production is not going to increase a lot. That's also a, a major point I, I want to share with you today. Uh, we expect palm oil production to recover from the lows seen this year. Uh, but given that we expect mostly uh, higher crush from soy, and that soy is mostly a, a meal uh, bean, we don't expect uh, a lot of uh, soft vegetal. Uh, to, to come up, a lot of higher vegetable to come up. So maybe plus 1.6 for soil, plus 1.5 for sun, and we expect, we expect rape oil production to decrease. And that's important as well because it should support uh, rapeseed prices at the end uh, of the line. So with a moderate growth in production, uh, we expect the global palm oil markets to remain quite tight uh, this year, which means we expect prices to remain rather supported for palm oil and also for the other veg oils. This year, uh, we see that compared with early 2015-16, where we, where we had about 9.6 million tons of stocks worldwide, uh, we should lose about 2 million tons uh, by the end of next year. So we are going to stabilize with the current situation, but it's not going to recover it to become a heavy situation where palm oil prices have to go down and find demand. So to conclude on the global context, I would say we have a bearish situation on the soy bean and the soy meal uh, because we have record crops uh, for soy bean and for maize. So that, that counts in the animal compound feed competition. Uh, the vegetal market seems uh, tighter, but unfortunately with the low crude oil prices, the, the price increases we see are capped by, uh, by this current situation. We, we cannot see prices spike back uh, to, the, to the levels they were two or three years ago. Okay. 
So if we focus now on the rapeseed uh, and uh, oilseed markets in general in the EU, the main thing is that uh, we have for the second year in a row a very big uh, fall in production uh, EU-wide. That's also true in the Black Sea uh, for Ukraine, of course, which is uh, one of the main uh, suppliers of, uh, of rapeseed in the EU. And on the contrary, we have big crops in Canada. It might be even higher than 19 million tons. Big crops as well in Australia and uh, in other countries. So that will change the global trade patterns. Uh, we'll see a sharp drop in uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian exports uh, to the benefit of, uh, of Australia mostly. And Canada should be able to maintain a high level of, uh, of exports. Uh, as you can see, it's 10 million tons uh, for 14.5 for on the, uh, the total globally, so, so it's huge, the, the share of Canada. And another thing that I think is, uh, is important is that we expect strong demand uh, on, on the right side. You can see strong demand uh, from the Asian countries, be it in China, in Japan, in Pakistan. Uh, so that means uh, that the EU uh, will need to fight with other uh, importing uh, countries to, uh, to buy supplies and to find higher supplies. Okay, so that's a tentative uh, assessment on the, the EU imports uh, per, by origin. So uh, as I said, we expect lower U Ukrainian uh, rapeseed to come into the EU higher Australian rapeseed uh, to be available. And Canada is still a big question mark because we have uh, a lot of, uh, of exportable supplies. Um, so we might see higher Canadian uh, imports than, than the figure that I, uh, that I have here. But I think uh, it may be a swap between Australia and Canada uh, because as I said, the Chinese and the Japanese and the Pakistanis demand uh, should remain strong. So maybe Canada will sell more to the EU and less to Pakistan, but Australia will do the contrary. So it, it might offset each other and it will be very difficult for the EU to increase its imports uh, up to 4 million tons, for example. I think 3.5 uh, is, uh, is okay. Uh, going up to 4 million tons might be another challenge. Looking into details now in the EU production, the, the sharpest falls in, uh, in the harvest uh, have been in the Western EU, France, uh, Germany, UK, uh, Poland as well, um, even though it's not exactly the, the Western uh, EU, but these main producers have seen uh, significant losses in harvest this year. And if you compare with two years ago, uh, the difference is very, very important. On the contrary, we have very good production in Romania and Bulgaria, and that offsets a little bit uh, the, the falls that we've seen uh, in this part of Europe. And that also changes the trade patterns within the EU. Uh, we see sharp uh, increase in, uh, in, ships, in shipments from the Black Sea uh, towards, uh, towards France, towards uh, the Netherlands, for example, countries like that. So I think that for the time being, it's also keeping a leash on the on the Western EU prices, because we have relatively cheap uh, rapeseed coming into the Western EU, uh, although I think it's, uh, it's beginning to, to get thinner now, and uh, that has prevented prices from going, from going up, I think, uh, in the past few weeks. One of the main consequences of lower production is that the crush margins are going to remain low this year. So, we expect crash production in the EU to decrease by uh, about 0.7 million tons down to uh, 23 million tons, depending on how well we can uh, import and how hard we fight to, uh, to take imports from, uh, from Canada and from Australia. But the main point is that we are not going to be able to crush a lot this year because of low supplies. Consequently, if you put together the supply and the demand, uh, you can see that we expect stocks to increase, to decrease, sorry, uh, quite significantly down to about 1.1 million tons at the end of the year, despite significant reduction in crush, uh, and, then, and despite also a reduction in the feed uh, use of rapeseed, so direct usage on farm, for example. 
uh, which is uh, forecast to be lower. So even though we already uh, forecast the lower demand, we will have uh, very low stocks. And uh, I think that's a key point preventing rapeseed prices from going down this year. So we even expect rapeseed prices to increase slightly on average, maybe up to uh, $450 Euro, uh, dollars a ton uh, in Hamburg. Uh, so that's not a big increase. Uh, they are at uh, 430 something like that today. So we we'll see a slight margin for prices to increase, but nothing uh, spectacular. That's the side uh, information I just gave you to, uh, to have the data. The sunseed market is much more balanced, but that's, uh, that's a side point. I'm not going to comment on that. So if you look at the rapeseed and the rape oil demand in the EU, uh, a key thing about that is the, the biodiesel market in the EU. So I was asked to give a few words about that. Uh, so maybe all of you are aware of how it works, but you know, just to, to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, it is uh, set by an EU framework uh, by the Directive 2009-28-CR, uh, 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 which is called the RED, uh, Renewable Energy Directive, uh, which at that time set a target of 10% uh, renewable energy into transport. And they had uh, GIG savings requirements regarding the feedstock. But that was quickly challenged, uh, namely by NGOs, uh, which said that the calculation uh, were not uh, right, not including the ILUX or the, the indirect land use change, which is uh, that you will grow a crop for biodiesel and you will replace a uh, crop uh, that was there before, which have which will have to be grown somewhere else. So you will have indirect impacts on land use changes. Uh, so the commission uh, in 2012 decided to suggest a limit uh, at 5% for what's called first generation biofuels. Uh, basically that's biofuels that could be used as well uh, in, um, in the food sector, at least the feedstock that could be used in the human consumption or feed consumption. And after three years of debate, uh, it was set at 7%. Uh, that limit, that, that uh, threshold was set at 7% for first generation biofuels. Besides that, there is another directive uh, called the FQD, uh, which sets uh, a target of 6% reduction in GHG uh, in fuels by 2020. So that two things are uh, driving the incorporation of biofuels uh, within the EU. But it's worth remembering that uh, the EU directives are, uh, are not applied uh, directly. They are translated into national policies and uh, some countries have more stringent rules than, than others. Some countries are more uh, looking forward for biofuels than others. So we have to look at the national level and uh, Germany, uh, two years ago now, uh, almost, uh, decided to change uh, completely the pattern of the, the biofuel policy, turning towards more GHG savings uh, policy, so like, like the FQD. So increasing step by step the threshold uh, up to 6% by 2020 uh, of uh, GHG reductions in, uh, in fuels. Uh, by the way, GHG is uh, gas house, uh, greenhouse uh, gas savings. But France, uh, which is also a big market uh, for fuels and for biofuels, uh, just decided to stick with the 7% incorporation rate with the special rules for biodiesel uh, up to 7.7%, including uh, renewal double counting uh, for 0.7%. So they are more like a red uh, policy. They're sticking to the red policy, sticking to a 7% target, and they're not they don't seem to change uh, their view for the future. Spain uh, is also remaining in the red uh, framework and increasing step by step its mandate. However, uh, it has increased its mandate this year, but we don't see actually uh, incorporation uh, of biofuels increasing. It's more stagnating. So it remains to be seen whether or not the, the increasing target will be met actually. In the UK, uh, I thought I just could put a question mark because it's, uh, it's very unknown for the time being. I expect 
statu quo for domestic policy, uh, which uh, is a relatively low uh, level of biofuels uh, incorporated in the, in the fossil fuels. But the key question I would I say is uh, regarding tariff, uh, ethanol tariff in the coming years. Uh, also, sugar tariff may may have an impact because uh, for some of the sugar is uh, can be allocated to ethanol. So that's uh, that's really yeah something that uh, we will have to keep in mind uh, for the for the years to come. Uh, what's going on with the ethanol industry in the UK? Uh, regarding the access to the continental market. That's not for this year, I think, but it's uh, something uh, worth keeping in mind. That's just an example of the monthly incorporation uh, from the data we have uh, from national sources. It's to illustrate the fact that uh, for about three years now, three years and a half even, we see uh, biofuel incorporation at best stagnate. Uh, the drop you see on Spain, for example, is because they reversed uh, their targets back in 2012, uh, at the end of 2012, because of the financial crisis. They said they couldn't afford to, sorry. I'm still Christoph Cunny, sorry. I couldn't they couldn't afford to to put that expensive policy in place, and so they, they reversed their rather high mandates at the time, uh, and that really cut biodiesel consumption quite sharply. Uh, Germany, even though they have switched uh, towards a new mandate, they're not increasing biodiesel incorporation, they're not increasing bioethanol incorporation either, uh, and the UK, more or less stagnating, they, are, they have more room to switch from ethanol to biodiesel in, in terms of incorporation. So that's why you see uh, a volatility, but basically it's, uh, it's around two or three percent uh, of incorporation, it's not much. And part also is due to low crude oil prices. Uh, the thing is when you look at national policies, uh, the most stringent are that if oil companies don't blend, they pay a fine, and uh, most of the time the fine is uh, fixed. It's a few hundred euros a, a ton of things like that. So if the spread between biodiesel and crude oil or between biodiesel and diesel uh, gets bigger, that's higher than the fine, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to blend. Uh, you rather pay the fine. So you really have to look at national level to, to see that. But you see uh, decreasing incorporation on average uh, in the biggest countries in Germany, of course, uh, I showed it as well before in, in other countries. However, we have a di higher diesel consumption, so the pool into which you blend your biodiesel is bigger. So more or less, uh, the biodiesel consumption is steady uh, for the past two years. And from 2017 onwards, we expect uh, it to increase slightly, but that could happen only with political changes. and. The fact that Germany is going to increase uh, its threshold for GHG savings could help the biodiesel industry there uh, to have a higher market share uh, from January onwards. Another point uh, that, uh, that is important uh, to keep in mind is that the imports uh, from Argentina, from Indonesia to the EU may recover after the rulings uh, that were uh, expressed at the WTO and at the European Court of Justice. So uh, back in 2013, the EU decided to put anti-tariff measures on the biodiesel from both these countries, uh, arguing of uh, different differences in the export taxes making the, the produce price of the soybean oil and the palm oil different from what it should be but that has been uh, found inconsistent with the WTO rules. So EU may have to, uh, to scrap the, the anti-tariff policy and that could help uh, quite significantly the, the imports towards the EU. Uh, so we'll see how it goes in the months ahead, uh, but that's something uh, worth keeping in mind that's threatening the, the biodiesel industry in the EU, I think, for the medium term. As I said, the consumption may grow and should grow, I think, in, G in Germany. 
maybe a little bit as well in Spain, depending on uh, whether or not they meet uh, the actual target. Uh, but the eubiodiesel production is not uh, seeing uh, to benefit a lot from it. Uh, maybe the German biodiesel industry a little bit, so it would be mostly based on white oil. So that's our tentative uh, supply and demand for biodiesel. As I said, higher consumption EU-wide, mostly in Germany, higher imports. Uh, that's a very tentative figure. It could back in, uh, in 2012, uh, it was uh, 3 million tons uh, of imports uh, into the EU, mostly in Spain, but also in other countries. And Raypoil may be able to increase slightly uh, its, uh, its share. However, uh, we have lower rape oil supplies. As I said earlier, we expect uh, rape seed crush to decrease and that should lead to lower rape oil production in the EU. Uh, it will be difficult to increase uh, rape oil imports uh, significantly. Even though we expect exports to be lower, uh, consumption has to be cut. Uh, so food, uh, human consumption has to be cut for, for rape oil. And as a consequence, uh, we expect the rape oil prices to remain above the soy oil price and the sun oil price as it's been now for, for a few weeks. So we expect the rape oil uh, price to, to maintain or to increase its premium compared to both these uh, competing oils because they need to lose demand uh, in the food sector to the benefit of, uh, of sun and of soy. And that leads me to think that the rapeseed prices in the EU should be relatively supported because we have a global vegetable environment uh, which is relatively tight, an EU rape oil market that is quite tight. Uh, so we need a premium uh, for the rape oil and we have uh, not enough rapeseed. So if, if the rape oil goes up and the rapeseed price doesn't move, the crush margins will be very, very big. So the rapeseed demand will will increase significantly, that can't happen. So, so the rapeseed price has to follow up the rape oil price to, to keep margins uh, thin. And that, uh, in, in recent uh, months, uh, has helped the, the rapeseed price compared with other commodities and especially compared to wheat. So in blue, you have the wheat price uh, on the Matif, uh, you're next. Uh, on the red, the rate price, and that's the ratio uh, on, in green. And we consider that uh, above 2 or 2.2, 2, uh, that ratio is favorable to rapeseed sowings, uh, because you have to take into account, if you translate that into uh, production margins, farmer production margins, you need a ratio of 2, 2.2, 2, uh, and we are now currently uh, close to 2.5, so the, the price ratios are very fa favorable to rapeseed sowings. However, we have seen in Western EU, especially a dry uh, summer and autumn, a dry uh, planting season. And that leads us to think that we'll, we will not be able to increase rapeseed uh, area a lot uh, next year. So that's our tentative forecast for, for the rapeseed uh, planting areas in major producing countries. So I'm bringing back the crystal ball right now, but we already have some uh, returns from the field. Uh, now it seems quite, uh, quite certain that on, in Western EU, we will not have an increase in area. Uh, it should decrease in France. It may be stable uh, in Germany. In the UK, uh, it should be stable or slightly down as well. And it could increase uh, in other countries, but they, these countries are, have a usually a lower yield. So we expect the 2017 rapeseed crop to remain quite low. So we'll see how it goes. It's, a, it's still a long way forward, but I think the tightness in the rapeseed market will continue, uh, will linger, and uh, that makes it a very interesting uh, commodity uh, to be into, uh, especially when compared to a rather bearish global environment uh, elsewhere. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm available right now or around the coffee. Thank you.
Thank you. Have we got any questions? Yes, we have a question on the front here, if you can bring the mic. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Guy Gagin from the National Farmers Union. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that vegetable oil is probably capped um, by the likely change in, in crude oil price. Is it possible for you to give us an estimate of, of perhaps the value, the financial value or the, on seed or even vegetable oil of the biofuel mandates in Europe and globally? So is there a premium because of that in the oil, oil and the seed markets? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. So, what is the value of biofuel mandates in Europe? In dollar terms, uh, well, in, in I, terms I couldn't say, but you, you could say that's about two-thirds of the rape oil consumption in the EU. Uh, you, if you go back there... Uh, yeah. Uh, you see that uh, biodiesel consumption, consumption is about uh, 6.3 million tons uh, of rape oil within the EU compared with less than 10 uh, for, the, for the total. So it's about two thirds roughly. Um, globally, if you go back, that, sorry, it's a little bit. Uh, but yeah, right there. We have a line called industrial use. It's not biodiesel only, but it's mostly biodiesel. And we expect uh, quite a significant increase in the soil uh, consumption for biodiesel in South America especially. Part of it is related to the, the import tariff uh, which might be scrapped. And part of it is because of a strong uh, mandate there and in the US. So, uh, sorry, it's not perfect, but if you see total consumption is about 150, 160 million tons of uh, vegetables for the four main vegetables and about roughly 30 million tons would be for biodiesel. Very rough estimate, but that's uh, one fifth or one sixth, maybe. That's the share of, uh, of biodiesel in the, in the market today. Question, question at the front again. Um, thank you very much, and uh, quite a stimulating presentation. Mike Hamley, farmer producer from Cornwall and NFU Crops Board. Um, the last bit of the presentation is particularly interesting. You, you're suggesting that. Uh, the, the market is, is indicating that the prices are favourable for the production of oilseed rape, and yet we're clearly not seeing that from a producer's point of view because of the constraints that are being played, placed upon us and the technologies available to us. When do you see that those market signals might have an impact on the political will and the way that uh, we're able to have access to technology to be able to respond to those markets? because it's not just the dry conditions at planting that, that are causing that reduction in plantings and the lack of response to those market signals. That's true. Uh, I think there is also a slight difference between the continental situation and the UK situation uh, because uh, two of my colleagues are working only on production pr uh, aspects and they call a lot of uh, cooperatives, for example, uh, all around Europe, and they, they don't seem to mention the the seed uh, constraints, for example, as a, as a very as major issue uh, on the continent, uh, which is not the same as in the UK. I think it might be because of the milder weather here in winter, uh, you don't have the same, uh, same pest issues, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the biggest concern, uh, in, be it in France or, or in Germany. And if you want the, uh, the price signal, maybe the 2.2, which I referred to as a favorable to rapes, it has to be increased a little bit uh, because you, if you cannot control your pest uh, as well as you used to, you need to have higher production costs, so it changes a little bit the calculation. Maybe you have to go to 2.3 or 2.4, but uh, I think the, the market, be it worldwide or especially in the EU, uh, shows quite a construct contrasted uh, vision between very, very buried grains and um, more balanced uh, outseed situation as a whole. And uh, I think for, as you said, Jack, uh, in France had the, the worst uh, wheat crop ever and the market barely seemed to notice, but back in June when people feared there would be a drought uh, in the US, the, the, the soybean price just sprang up. So for the, for the um, 
old seed complex, we are just one crop away from one bad crop away from from seeing prices spike again, and that should directly lead to to higher revenues for farmers, I guess. Thank you very much. Well, that neatly takes us to uh, our coffee break. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you very much, Jack. They will be around if you want to color them. <laughs>